are you going? The known path or your own path? Iona College is where you'll be given the means to dream and find meaning in your dreams. To serve while you learn and learn while you serve. To fight the good fight and to own your path. So where are you going? Iona College, learn outside the lines. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the EGFC. We are back for week 12 of SSBU action. My name is Soy. Joining me at the desk is UBL. UBL, how's it going? Hey, it's been a pretty solid week thus far, and we're ready to kick it off once more back with a qu uh, quintuplet, quad four, four matches. <laughs> <laughs> of four collegiate colleges looking to get uh, get into the next wave of playoffs as there are only after this one four weeks left to go in the season of course coming up first will be Iona and Kenesius Ken Canisius. Canisius Canisius College I'll, I'll get it. <laughs> Canisius. No, I, I I mostly know it because it's my alma mater so we, so oh. you know I uh, but yeah, no, so I do know a couple Sorry of guys on this. Yeah, no, so no worries. But yeah, no, let's take a look at that schedule because we've got some interesting matchups uh, coming up. You know, obviously we've got Kanisha's first Iona to start the day. The MAC battle uh, kicking off our schedule. UTA versus South Alabama, two of the newer teams to the EGF scene going head to head. Seton Hall and St. John's, a battle in the Big East bracket. And then we end our day with another newcomer in uh, Weber State going up against Marquette. So really a, a, an interesting day because like you said, we're starting to get down the stretch here in the regular season. Five weeks left if you, if you include this week. So really every single game matters for that playoff race. Yeah, this will be a very, every week is going to be an important week as we get to down the stretch. But this week especially, as you start to see teams uh, compete head to head for some last minute slots and points to uh, get ahead in those uh, in those head to head battles, as you mentioned with this one, uh, Canisius and Iona in that MAC conference battle. But in the same vein, we get to see teams that are shaping up to be definitely in the running. You have to be able to put away the teams that are that you're supposed to be able to, and we'll be able getting to see if UT Arlington and St. John's can do that today. Yeah, we'll have to see. Those are games that are going to be very interesting because UTA uh, they are you know brand new as of this split so far undefeated and for those teams that are joining as of the spring split it is not record based it is win percentage based so those games are even more valuable and the fact that uta are still undefeated through the first three weeks of this split that they jump up all the way to i believe you know one of the top five-ish teams in the standings because of that perfect win percentage so a game against south alabama that will be fun to watch but let's focus back in now on our first match of the day canisius versus iona the mac battle to kick off our day it's a very close battle if you look at the stat sheet canisius is four and seven on the season iona five and six overall and really two teams that are you know, dead in the center of that MAC conference. And when MAC conference playoffs come around, it, this is a potential first round battle, essentially. And all the more in reason to get started and get on the right foot again in these games. You, If you're expecting to see this team more and more down the stretch, especially in the playoff running, not only do you want to cement the fact that you can beat this team, whether it be one team or the other, but also have an idea of how they want to align their roster and how their players perform under a little bit of stress. And the other uh, important note to the rest of these matchups as well is that when we're talking about playoff brackets, for the national bracket overall, it's the top half of the league makes it. So I believe for the... Smash Brothers scene, we've got about 26 schools, so only the top 13 really qualify. So if you're still around that 500 level of of your record, like these two teams are, you're going to have to probably break that if you're going to make that national bracket or win your conference, which is going to be very difficult, especially the way 
that in particular the MAC conference for these two teams has been playing out with it being so top heavy. Teams like Siena still, uh, you know, near the top of the standings. Quinnipiac undefeated, I believe, or actually only one loss, but undefeated so far, I believe, through conference play. Marist has looked on fire, and Iona and Canisius have both had their moments. So this is a, a pivotal moment for both of these two schools. Yeah, it's it's nut up or shut up. It's time to break that 500 record. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're hovering around the middle of the road, if, if there's any other tricks or, or sequences that they have, they can come across, now is the time, whether it be changing up how they order their lineup or if it's a player that, if it's one of the individual leggings or rungs of these players that are going to step up and prove to be more than just a hidden boss, uh, Canisius and Iona are really on the hot seat. Yeah, they really are rankings. No, absolutely. Uh, and when you look at these teams again, there's only so many games left and only so many of those are conference games. In fact, I believe both these teams only have maybe two or three uh, conference games remaining in their schedule. So the out of conference play also becomes important. But when you look at these teams overall, you see a lot of potential with both sides of, of the of the coin here. For example, for Canisius, you've got players like Flapjack who have been kind of the go-to guy for the difficult matchups. The, you know, you pin him against your best player and see what he can do. And he's come out on top more times than not. He's seven and two this season. But the question for Canisius is, how is the depth of the roster doing? Can the depth of this roster, you know, really have that success in the past? And for Iona, it's the same type of question. They like to front load their roster. They like to put all their heavy hitters in early and see what the depth of their roster can do, if they can hold on or not. But as we say that, we are started with set number one here. A fly, or sorry, a fly going in against Ramen Bomber, the Pichu making his first appearance on stream. Oh, and if it's your first appearance, this is not what you want to see as a Pichu player going right into what is arguably Pichu's worst matchup, period. The Game & Watch coming out here on Final Destination, and it is starting to show like it. <laughs> Yeah, this is a, a tough matchup, but we've also seen Iona in the past not afraid to play some of these tougher matchups. Uh, they have a, a Pikachu by the tag of Loser who they actually opted into this matchup once, so not necessarily afraid of it, but like you said, Afly kind of playing this to the mark right now as he does have that big stock lead. Yeah, it's a tricky it, it's a tricky way to play into, uh, into a tough start of a round. I mean, we've talked at length about how both these teams really need to get off to a right start in the latter half of this season, and so that up throw into Thunder is not going to work, but the dash back forward smash will cover as A-Fly does drop his stock, and if you're Pichu, 56% is basically death percent anyway, so might as well start going all in if they can find a proper starter, which Game & Watch players are certain to negate as the down smash ends at a horrible angle and closes it out with yet another down smash sweet spot that time. Very good catch there by A-Fly. Not only does he catch the first bucket, but he also gets Ramen Bobber, excuse me, Bomber off stage. And then like you said, that down frame catching him before he can snap to the ledge. So A-Fly again with the stock lead and starting to rack up that percent already at 63 is Ramen Bomber and really nowhere to go on FD. He's able to up be away, but he's kind of working on borrowed time here at 92. Oh, but then air dodge, that is going to absolutely be a huge, huge plus for Iona. Just getting the free stack dropped, but it is the roll in caught yet again that keeps A Fly from fumbling his lead. And those rolls, those tech chases across FD, they're, they proved extremely extremely vital because that was many a many stock of that a fly found not only on this roll in but also on the first and second stock or on the third stock as well yeah a couple of times catching that roll and that stock too that sd from a fly was huge because yeah, we talked about it before but if you are just tuning in for the first time that 
uh, the way the points work in this format is you get a point for every stock remaining. And so for this to be a one stock instead of a two stock, that point could really matter down the line with these teams being so close. But either way, A-Fly able to take game one. And Ramen Bomber, you saw some opportunities like you saw there on that forward smash. He was able to catch A-Fly out. But it, re it really did kind of feel like Ramen Bomber was kind of at a loss for, you know, what to do in this matchup. And I can't blame him, right? The Game & Watch character, when played correctly, functions almost as a hard counter to Pikachu, let alone Pichu, who has who cannot play nearly as safe, nearly as uh, tight as how Pikachu can play in such a in such a matchup that is so hard to find their openings. Pichu has to go in. You're on a clock just by picking the character by the nature of the self damage and also being by and large the by far the lightest character in the game it's hard to play around that kind of character and that kind of matchup which is why we're seeing the switch here to joker not necessarily the a true hard counter to game and watch game and watch struggling with disjoints and large range first and foremost but the speed of joker being able to get in and out and not to mention the ability to catch up the out of shield with a uh, with a couple of double jump forward airs and the existence of our send keeps Joker in a solidly in a solid position in this matchup particular. Certainly feels a lot more manageable off the start. That being said, Ramen Bomber off to an early deficit, 97 or excuse me, 96 on him already. And I think the question is in this game too. You know, Ramen Bomber seems to like these combo characters, but he can't land a combo himself when he's grounded like that. Another down smash lands, and it's an easy follow-up for A-Fly. Getting out of combos. Combo breakers are so huge as that forward smash almost takes his stock town and city. Oh, that's tragic. Oh, no. Getting hit out of the tether by just a weak hit of up B as Ramen Bomber drops that second stock like it was nothing. What a huge opportunity there. A-Fly taking advantage, and all of a sudden, Ramen Bomber on his last stock at 60%. Down air not going to land from it. a fly. Trying to find his way back. He does manage to get the dash attack, though, but a fly's got to be careful here. He's at 100%, and like we said, every stock matters. If he wants to try and get that three stock, that would be a massive amount of, uh, excuse me, a massive amount of points on the board. And they're both at dangerous percents. That's a hard read that's not going to work out. The forward smash punish takes the first stock. The key thing for Ramen Bomber is that they are just not respecting the game and the game and watch factor, to put it bluntly. Game and watch is an extremely tough character to whiff punish. So by not respecting the fact that Game & Watch can place out so many hard-hitting buttons, so much coverage within that zone, then you're just going to keep falling into some insane hits and some insanely hard punishes, but just narrowly missing the up the edge guard. What's a fly having a chance? A fly. A fly. To, uh, either way. <laughs> a chance closing out the game with relative, relatively consistent fashion, knowing the, the strengths of their character and punishing accordingly. A fly takes out uh, Ramen Bomber with a pair, with a one stock into a two stock, and honestly, that one stock against the Pichu very well should have been a two stock. Yeah, for a you know five point overall victory here for for a oh, fly. Yeah. It was a very much so a commanding set from him. Like you said, Ramen Bomber just uh, couldn't really get anything going here. As we look on this last stock, Ramen Bomber gets up from okay. ledge. And he, does he try to spot dodge this? He spot dodge? It, like, okay, usually I don't try to be as aggressive sometimes. But my dude, you spot dodged. And then as we roll in here, he spot dodged into down smash game and watch is over here interesting <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, uh, yeah i uh 
I, I might, <laughs> we're getting word that he might have wanted to counter it, but uh, I, I even I don't know about that one. It's uh, still, you know, some sometimes stuff like that happens. It's you know, I guess it you know, hard situation for Rom and Bomber in the first place, right? I mean, there's there's also something to be said like when you are in a situation like this where just your game plan is not working. There's also something to be said about just a frustration factor. You just want to try and hit your opponent. You just want something to land. And so you go for something a little crazy, like a down smash after a spot dodge, and it ends up not working. And maybe that's what happened here to Ramen Bomber. We can only speculate. But it certainly did feel like, well, like you said, A-Fly was really, you know, he just did kind of the same thing over and over because, well, Ramen Bomber kept trying his same game plan over and over. Oh, that was intentional, that reverse edge guard. That was it's cheeky on a, on a fly's part. Very nice, very nice stuff. As we do get to see the, the one stock that Ramen Bomber took, but it's it's just so tough when you are, whether intentional or not, and as frustrated as you're getting in a matchup like that, it is what Game & Watch is built to do. So you cannot, the first and, and foremost thing to do is to not lose your head, and that is exactly what seemed like Ramen Bomber did at the uh, as the game I mean, as the game slowly progressed further and further, just getting frustrated, wanting to drop a stop, wanting to drop their stock, force uh, forcing interactions, and flat out not respecting the space that a, a that a fly dominated. It's one of those cases, too, where I think it's very easy to tunnel vision when you have a very combo heavy character, right? You have a Pichu that just loves to, you know, string together hits. Joker is known for those drag down up air combos and so on and so forth. And so it's very easy to just say, I just want to go in. I just want to hit my opponent. But there are characters like Game & Watch, like Bowser's that we've seen here in the EGF and a few others that can play that more defensive style and say, all right, if you're going to come approach me, I know exactly what to do out of this. And A-Fly, that's his bread and butter, and uh, he was able to get five points off the back of it. Yeah, a a very, very strong start for Canisius, who are looking to, to break through that ceiling, and five points is a way to do it, as Ram and Bomber will be succeeded by Yaliso, Yaliso, uh, on Iona's part, and Mikol Rising will take the stage for Canisius. Yeah, uh, this is another intriguing matchup. Uh, Yaliso is one of these uh, me fighter characters. He's he, he's played, I believe, all of the different me uh, fighters in this game. Me sword fighter, me brawler, me gunner, uh, and his movement is really what stands out. Very very tricky in how he kind of manipulates his his character to you know approach sometimes. On the flip side of that, uh, Mikol Rising is this Ness player that uh, we didn't get to see last split, but uh, he because he was he spent a semester abroad, but he's back now, and he was a huge portion of this team last year, uh, getting numerous kind of clutch victories for Canisius. He, you know, when Canisius won, he had a big day. When Canisius lost, he was shut down. So he's a very pivotal player, I think, for the Golden Griffins lineup. And this will be a very interesting matchup. Yoliso is another kind of key player for Iona, six and three on the season. And the various me fighters, I mean, they all have their own kind of tri uh, tips and tricks to them. And against the Ness, who knows? Who knows which one we'll see? This is a tricky one for sure, especially if you, they're going into this game with a uh, trying to decide which me dependent on matchup. Because against Ness, you traditional knowledge makes you think against Ness, against these PK kids and many other characters, you want to have that stable disjoint, uh, and that's something like Me Sword Fighter offers. But Me Sword Fighter is without a doubt the worst of the three, and is very <laughs> easily counterplayable by just about any competent player, of which everybody in this league is. So you've flip the script a little bit who is then going to be best most flexible into a majority of matchups 
that uh, that title can arguably go to me gunner who has the ability to who is one of the truest zoners in the game not only on their flexibility but also with their normals and the movement that they apply but me brawler has had a lot of has had some stocks rising as of <laughs> late with some dedicated high level players like Larry Lur and Esam picking up the character and pushing their meta and pushing their not only neutral game but also meta game for multiple different finishers and multiple different styles whether it be the hurricane kick or the thrusting uppercut or the uh, the soaring axe kick a lot of these specials and a lot of these move pools are greatly greatly explored to the point where me brawler is without a doubt the most flexible of the three which may prove to be most important when heading into a, a matchup that you couldn't don't always know but we are seeing the sword fighter yeah and uh it's like you said this one makes sense for i think this specific style of matchup right because you have that ability to contest from a distance and on Final Destination 2, another kind of interesting stage choice because there's nowhere to run from these projectiles. And right now, Yaliso really pressing forward here, has not been touched so far this stock. And Nicole rising at 105 before he lands his first hits. All right. Important. I can see what you mean. Uh, just right off this start of this game, and it's a super important setup. Yaliso plays fast. He's not just moving around, but every input, every decision is coming immediately after the last without as so much as a, a moment to think or breathe. Nicole, it'll have to be how they respond to that tempo will be important for this set. And thus far, Nicole is answering in turn, trying to keep Nicole down as we return to neutral. Things, at least percent-wise, have evened back up all of a sudden. Nicole at nearly 140 and Yaliso, now he's at 113, but Nicole Rising is off stage. He'll be able to air dodge back. No follow-up on that tornado, but the good coverage on that dash attack takes the first stop. The fast falls are, I find, are super interesting from Yaliso, who are trying to constantly come down with a raw input Nair. And of course, the uh, the special move set isn't too crazy all from Yaliso, but how they're managing it is extremely good. But Nicole Rising coming in here with the uh, the up smash at ledge, the Ness classic, where you're just always so threatened by the active hitbox and the reversal slash coming in from on the PK fire as well. Yaliso dominating this center stage on FD, where there is just nowhere to go. And you can tell Nicole really struggling to get back right now. He'll be able to up B back to ledge, but he's at 116. He'll get that PK fire off, so no follow for Yaliso. Trying to find a combo of his own, but he cannot do so. And Yaliso just continuing to kind of pester this nest. There's really not a lot of room for Nicole to go anywhere, but he does find a grab, gets a back throw, and gets a little bit more damage on. And Yaliso got to be careful here. He will be up being back to stage after eating his own up B and he's at 76 but like you said Nicole is just being constantly pressed by this quick movement I like how there is the response though and the response is to play to his strengths to the strengths of his character no less Nicole trying to rely more on shield even though the disjoint from Yaliso is so prevalent we're seeing a, a, some scrambling in the air, though, as a grab comes in from Nicole, the back throw won't do it quite yet, but this is where you can start to set up into the and it, without the red sparks, but it still takes the stock. What a huge stock for Nicole rising to take there. Those up smashes are doing a lot of work, and things are pretty much back to even here. Yaliso is actually at a little bit of a percent differential right now, but he's slowly starting to work that way back. Back and forth they go fighting for center stage control, and a lot of these projectiles really starting to land for the side of Yaliso now. But Cole at up to 82%, trying to fight his way out of this corner. And it's very dangerous right now for both of these players. And McColl continues to be chipped away at. That forwarder not going to connect. Nair will. McColl, I don't think he's got a jump, but he will be able to be back to ledge. Oh, got to be careful with the aggressive use of their double jump from McColl. 
forcing some very, uh, some PK Thunder 2 recoveries, which you don't love to commit to, though you feel a lot more safe. Oh, uh, the up behind, that was an amazing mix-up coming out from Yaliso as the game got down to the wire. Many, a many recoveries were always just you going low, right to ledge, no big deal. That time, it came in as soon as Mikol felt comfortable uh, trying to attack the ledge. Yeah, that, I, like you said, what a huge mix-up by Aliso. That was so smart, too, because that was really the first time he'd used that upbeat to recover high and back to stage, and Mikol not quite ready for it, so... Yaliso will be taking game one via one stock and uh, it's a very interesting matchup to watch because like you said you have Yaliso kind of throwing all these first punches and then McCall Rising finds his openings to kind of even things back up but it's always Yaliso throwing the first punch and McCall rise, uh, Rising uh, responding. Oh running out of invulnerability there. Yes I completely agree it's you it's Yaliso starting strong and trying to keep that going without uh, keep that going and hunt for the the stock at the same time but what gets them these early leads is the use is the utilization of not only things like tornado as we see in the stock here on the replay but also the effective use of chakram Chakram is a very important tool in this setup, in this setup for me, Swordfighter, and in every setup for me, Swordfighter, because you basically don't use any of the other side specials. Because you have, it's a projectile that has multiple functions in both the tilt and smash input, multiple angles that can be angled up, uh, angled high, low, or straightforward, and covers full, uh, nearly full stage. And against a character like Ness, who loves to move around and has the ability to absorb multiple types of projectiles or at least evade them, the flexibility of Chakram generally sets off every stock in a very comfortable fashion for Yaliso. But we can't sleep on McCole Rising, who after every rough start, after every time the floodgates were open, McCole would respond and make it close. Yeah, just one or two openings, and I feel like that's kind of the, the name of the set right now for at least these two in particular. It's that they both find their windows, but it's who can really confirm those stocks first. And you saw in that first set, Yaliso was getting that stock, you know, in the race to get the stocks first. Yaliso was winning that race every time, but only by a, a, a short amount, I should say, because like we saw, almost every stock was coming down to the wire. And as we get ready for set number two here, I'm curious to see what stage they've opted to go for. They're running it back to Final Destination, actually. And I don't mind this at all. It was so close the first time around. I'm curious to see what adaptations they bring through. I like the point you made about the chakra mode. The, the fact that you can mix up those angles and, you know, throw it at different distances is really something that, you know, it's another wrinkle to the game plan that McCall Rising has to worry about. And also, it interacts with that up B, which you can see McCole Rising is using a couple of times to contest at a distance. The, the cycle of movement is extremely difficult for McCole Rising to get a beat on. So they have just simply stopped trying to catch Yaliso while they're in midair. They're playing grounded and they're playing under their own jurisdiction. As that is no jump from Yaliso, but they are saved by the PK Thunder. A little bit of an unfortunate uh, circumstance there, but Yaliso is able to get out of it thanks to some help, and ooh, that could have been a follow-up. Waits for the air dodge. That was smart. Can he follow up on this? No, doesn't find the grab, but the Cole Rising will take some damage, and he's still trapped in the corner trying to find some ways around these tornadoes. That side B will even things right back up, and it's back to this very close game. The run-in grab. The back throw won't do it quite yet. Oh, looking for the roll read as the stone scabbard once again comes in from ledge, reacting to the read attempt from McCole Rising and punishing accordingly. That'll put Yaliso on the front foot, but will it last long? That Nair out of shield won't quite do it. Trying to hit him with the tail of it, but missing the backer out of shield. That getup attack could have been punished with just a simple Nair, which could have taken the stock, but nothing doing yet from uh, McCole Rising. 
really needing to close this out and hunting for a way, that will do it. Smart play there, that uh, forward air. You can get that drag down into the grab like you saw, and Nicole able to do just that. Things are back to relatively even as Nicole rising at 52%. But look at that, the down tilt into the grab, and all of a sudden percents back to practically dead even. And once again, these two just kind of punch for punch back and forth. And I'm kind of waiting to see if either one of them can really grab the momentum and, and carry it further, but it seems like that's not the case. They just are, are well aware of what each other want to do. One of the few grabs of the game coming out from Yaliso, which has been just great corner pressure. Whenever they are hit, whenever Nicole Rising has been hit by a tornado, Yaliso has gotten something off of it, though it hasn't always been immediate. That It's a really great sense of advantage as again! These upbees on the stage have just not missed. And I, I wonder, you know, McCoy rising there, he sends out that up smash, and somehow it gets weaved around by that upbee. That one will not do so, and Yaliso will lose his stock. We're down to the last stocks here. Remember, if Yaliso wins this one, they win the set and get themselves some bonus points. If not, we're going to game three, but we'll have to see here things still relatively even, but it's McCall Rising getting the advantage on this stock. Look at the percent differential that's already been racked up. And this is what happens when you can solve a game plan. As the up smash almost spaced correctly to cover the roll, but not finding it. Yalisa with a chance going for the down air, which could have been a very harsh spike, but nothing, uh, not finding it. It's doing their best to keep their spacing game on, to coming down with these nares and, and pacing out with these backers. No way. Just committing a little too late, a fraction too late, as Nicole Rising without a jump had one way to get back to stage, yet Yaliso fumbling ever so slightly. Oh, he, he gambled it all on red and it came up black. McCole Rising, that upbeat connects in time before the down air and. McCole Rising takes game two, so we'll go to game three between these two players, and once again, back and forth, but you look at the way those stocks were taken, I'm a little scared for Yaliso. The only way he was really able to take those stocks was via that up B. I'm gonna fall back on what I said at the begin before the set even started. Me Swordfighter isn't considered a good character not for their tools but for how linear their game plan is Swordfighter can do a lot of interesting stuff and has a, that same amount of flexibility that comes with a customizable move pool but when your neutral and uh, and uh, side specials are basically the same two moves in order to maintain viability the chakram and the tornado I mean we basically never see them without those two suddenly the character can be get a lot more solved a lot quicker and it really seems like McCole rising after getting overwhelmed at first it was able to consistently make uh, make adjustments and make comebacks as we're seeing on that final stock you could argue that in this in this final segment uh, Yaliso should have been should have gone for the edge guard just frames frames earlier but that little bit of hesitation on what was his own comeback attempt costed him the entire game and puts the first point on the board for iona we'll have to see here because you know oh, excuse me puts another <laughs> point on the board for can can see it can you shoot Canisius. <laughs> Canisius. No. I'm, I'm, I'll get it. <laughs> I'm always the No better. worries. No worries. It's, uh, it's, it, you know, uh, this is, uh, this is a, again, two, two teams that go back and forth, two players that are going back and forth, and just those little hesitations can make all the difference there. You saw, especially towards the end of that stock in particular, how many downers did Yaliso throw out? I think there were at least three or four attempts at that down air. I think half of them landed, and the one that didn't was the, was the one that ended up being the most costly uh, in that case. So I'm curious to see what Yaliso brings to the table here, because it really did start to feel like McCool Rising was 
like you said, catching on to that game plan. And there's the switch, the me gunner making an appearance on PS2. Oh snap, it's Doom Guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and immediately unveiling the, the suite of specials. We have Missile, we have Charge Shot, and the Down B Bomb. Up special will be seen a little bit later, but this has come to be something that you expect from me, Gunner, who has a lot of tools to keep the z uh, to not only set up their own zone, as it is the multi, it's the multi-directional up B, the one without a hitbox. Right. They have a lot of ability to set up their own zone in combination with that forward air able to uh, spring them backwards. Traversing stage is of no issue. But while you can take it slow, Nicole Rising has been rather relaxed when it comes to confronting this me gunner. Though a huge explosion uh, starts to even up the percentages. It, it's reminiscent of what you were saying before of, you know, when Yuliso, Yuliso's movement, it's so tricky, it's so hard to catch, but at the end of the day, he's got to approach you at some point. It feels like Nicole Rising is just saying, okay, do all your movement, I'll be ready for your projectiles, I'm just waiting for you to come into, into my range and my space. But that being said, I think the uh, projectiles are really starting to hit their mark now as Yuliso with that percent lead. Yeah, and if set up like this, it's all about cadence. The and it's all about patterns, I guess is a better word for it. Yeliso is loving these platforms and loving to move between them with forward airs and B reverse uh, charge shots and all of that good stuff. But if McCole Rising can get a beat on when they're going to be crossing stage, Ness's suite of aerials can be used very effectively. The ledge play like this. When you're able to trap ledge from full, from basically half stage, you're feeling pretty good about your trap. 165 right now. McCall Rising kind of working on borrowed time. That bomb actually connects, and it will be the stock. That's the first time I've seen that move take a stock in a, a, a long time. Eliso is at 112, but they will be able to make it back to stage there with that good drift around that up B. So... Now Yuliso, once again, finding that first stock on the board like he has through the majority of this set. Can McCool Rising find a way to answer back here? It's going to be a whole lot trickier because now you're almost forced to try and pull the trigger early. And McCool Rising doing so multiple times on this ledge, looking for the yo-yo as a means of a finisher which Yaliso has had an answer for every single time with this me gunner, but the back throw will do it for Yaliso, uh, for McCole Rising, evening this up in stocks, but they still need to make up a 40%. This will get there. That a pair of PK fires, even without a finisher, is a ton of damage. Nearly 40% on the board there. There's been a couple of times that McCole Rising has used forward air to knock those bombs back and away and i'm not sure that's intentional or not but it was able to get a little bit of percent on the board for himself now that being said a couple more forward airs being landed that up b will not go and yelisa will be able to grab the ledge now he's looking for a way back to stage and that tricky movement once again gets him back to it and the script is flipped as mccall now is the one in the corner trying to fight for stage control and just keeps eating these charge shots there. I don't believe they're fully charged, but they are doing a lot of work for Yuliso. Yeah, you would see the charge uh, on the gun, I believe, flashing, but either way, it, they, uh, there it is. It's, it's still a ton <laughs> of damage, and it's used, it's used almost entirely exactly like that, and I can point it out in the replay a little bit later, but... This movement on Yuliso's part has netted them so many openings, more so than they had with the Mii Swordfighter, just being by the fact that we're on a bigger stage and a lot more flexibility when it comes to bouncing in between platforms. FD did not give them this level of uh, utility with their own kit. It's very evident, because right now, McCole Rising he feels that pressure of, hey, this is my last stock. I need to find a way to take this one and give myself a chance. But tracking down Yuliso is something few players have been able to do. And those projectiles continue to work away. 
at this last stock for Nicole Rising. Now, Yaliso at 100%. He does have to be very careful here. Ness does have a lot of kill power in their kit. That up smash, though, well spaced around by Yaliso. That Nair just getting around that hitbox. And now Nicole Rising up to 48, trapped on ledge once more. The pressure continues from all these projectiles. The missile lands and quickly working their way behind them is Yaliso. He'll opt to go back to the ledge and then quickly rolls back to center stage. And look at where McColl Rising is just searching for any kind of opening on Yaliso. Oh man, those are not Samus missiles and that is not the same type of character. If you go into trying to play the Me Gunner matchup like it is similar to some other zoners, you're going to get overwhelmed by just the raw presence of the character and how they're able to cross uh, so much distance so quickly and it is all about that forward air look at the burst that comes with it i'm gonna actually i'm gonna be a little cheeky and reset this video look at the look at where they start here they're over on this platform uh or just slightly above right they're in this space by the end of this stock they will be here when they take the shot Getting here to here in maybe a second is absolutely absurd. Yeah, no, I, that's that's absolutely well. It was on the, the last one, but there it is. There's there's the there's the movement. <laughs> Full explanation, they did a, uh, wait, I accidentally paused the video. In that full explanation, they did a rep on the platform, looped around with both miss with both missiles and bombs before is, is firing themselves to the other side of the stage and firing the charge shot. It is, so much can happen with this me gunner and quite honestly, it was, uh, it was rough to watch McColl Rising try and shoot at ghosts it is the, the the tricky part of trying to catch yaliso a few players have been able to do so and the movement can just like you said if you're not used to playing against me gunner it, it is a very slippery character yaliso makes full uh, or takes full advantage of that kit and i also liked how you know the the charge shot was also well not only was it very safe to use the times that it was able to take the stocks but it was also covered on that last stock even if McCool Rising approaches for something like a grab in that scenario, he's landing on top of one of his own downbeats. So a grab will not work in that case, and that's one of Ness's best kind of kill moves. Yeah, the finishers for Ness are very... Uh, are centered around that grab and those smashes as that this this interaction here. Let's, let's, let me reset this and slow it down for you. These the, the platform movement, I love to stress on it, but the platform movement is so crucial but when it what was a huge tell is when uh, yalisa was on a platform like this with a charge shot they would always fire it after a b reverse they would run off can't switch up their momentum and then fire the shot that happened multitude of times but it felt like mccall rising was not taking it as a part of a full pattern but always trying to deal with the projectiles as they were coming. When was a missile? When was a bomb? Deal with the immediate threat, which can ha do which can do you well in a major in a ton of different matchups for a ton of different zoners where they only have one or two projectiles going for them. But this this was a full suite and a full house of damage, and we get to see that B reverse come in and close out the second stock. It's so so devastating for uh for your Liso, who had such a depth of tools at their disposal but what came down uh, but what came down to it what i feel like is that mccall rising would continuously give away their hand a little bit early they wanted to find stocks with grabs they wanted to find stocks with the uh the yo-yos at ledge and they had no backup plan it felt like their backup plan was just to reset neutral which would and it takes a long time to get me gunner and uh, me gunner of yaliso's caliber back in disadvantage yeah no i i agree i mean even in the uh, <laughs> even in the yeah, no, absolutely even in the the very first parts of that matchup uh 
you know, it seemed like, hey, if Yalisa is just going to do all this fancy movement and not going to approach me, then he, MKL Rising, or sorry, McCall Rising could just, you know, kind of wade the storm and then punish accordingly. But Yaliso caught on to that strategy, I think, pretty quickly, because after that first stock, it was all of a sudden McCall Rising just got chipped away at, you know, time and time again. Those projectiles started to land more and more often because it's just not it's not just one, two, three. It's one, two, three in different patterns, in different scenarios. And it was just, again, a lot to keep track of. And all of a sudden now it's back to a dead even game as we get ready for set number three. Yeah, six points to five, and that is a that's pretty big on the fact that McCall Rising was able to close out that game against the Me Sword Fighter, able to maintain this slim lead, and one point can make all the difference. But as we go into the third round of this set, it'll determine a lot as Weepson and Chef, with a capital F, take <laughs> the stage for Canisius and Iona, respectively. Yeah, so Chef is going to be a new player for Iona. We have not seen this tag before so far this season, so curious to see what they bring to the table here in, a, in you know what is really a pivotal set. This Whoever wins this really puts their uh, opponent on the back foot. They'd have to win at least one more set just to you know keep pace uh, in terms of how the points work out. For the other side of that, Kanisha sending in Weebson. Weebson has gone exclusively Dark Pit uh, for the two seasons that he's been in the EGF. And uh, this season it has been a little rough. Two and eight so far, but he has been tasked with some difficult matchups. He's often one of these players uh, in, well, similar scenarios to this, where this is a, a set that could turn the tide or you know go up against one of the top players uh, just to try and hold on, get some points, or possibly win. Who knows? Chef opting for the hero pick here in set number three. This is a matchup that is, well, very unique, I guess. Uh, we don't really see this in the EGF. Yeah, hero offers a, a very interesting set of skills as the uh, as Weepson tries to maintain their uh, maintain their play and maintain their space with this pit. Hero can be played in a bevy of different ways, but what really keeps Hero in the metagame is the fact that they, and against players and characters that like to take their time, Hero benefits from that immensely. So Weepson, uh, willing, willingly approaching and willingly trying to break that space is exactly the way you need to play against Hero. Never let them pull up menu, never let them get the time to, to farm the spells and to farm the MP. Though, that will, that's exactly the reason why you don't want to let them do that. <laughs> because you have to deal with a multitude of haymaker spells, yet when it's only one landing, this puts Weepson in a really great resource position. They just need to close out the stock as the back air comes down very well spaced on Chef's part. The spacing on that back air, like you said, very well done. And Weepson finds himself in an early deficit. Those side Bs are doing a lot of work, but they're not gonna take the stock quite yet. This forward throw should do it though. And things just like that are back to even between these two. It's almost a complete difference of character archetype in a lot of ways. Pit is the the no the very few gimmicks like purely like setup and neutral, just playing the game as a means of what Smash Brothers offers him effectively. In this case, Dark Pit. Hero in the meantime is an entirely different brand of character, offering them such a depth of move pool that is available to them at completely random times. It's a lot to handle for on both sides, and both players are treating it with this, uh, the amount of respect that I would expect from two cautious players knowing the stakes of this game. Ooh, that smash was throwing <laughs> cautious to the window. <laughs> that was very close to landing, which could have been massive for Chef as percents relatively even here, but still in favor of Chef. And that dash attack does connect. So Iona 
in the lead here. Weeb's gonna have to find a way to respond once again. That Nair does not connect, and that down air to 24. My goodness, that's a lot of percent. The power of oomph, it's such a huge, it's a 1.2% bonus, I believe, though you also get bonus damage placed on yourself as in the, out of the corner comes the electroshock arm, a, a, a DP of sorts, especially on neutral getup, but they don't go for it again, the Zapple interrupting them, as that's a ton of mana that just got thrown off the board with the level 3 fire and thunder spells thrown at a Weebum, a Weebson, but no stock off quite yet as okay okay <laughs> i see i see where his heart <laughs> lies uh, you know sometimes you just gotta try it you gotta see i guess uh but i mean this does make things a little bit more interesting in terms of the point factor because now it's only a last stock scenario here that reflected a lot of damage 53 now on the side of Chef, but Weeps in here, he's got to play very carefully if he wants to try and bring this one back. He is at 112 himself. Been trying to catch a lot of these uh, double jumps or air dodges with the Nair, but not quite spaced out. He'll be able to grab the ledge, and he got around the Magic Burst. That's a huge opening for Weeps in. He's got him up in the air. Can he find him? No, he can't. Chef will land, the forward air connects, and Chef closes out game one. Oh, that was a tight finish with quite literally pixels separating the grab from ledge from Weebson. As uh, we get to see the roll on, but we don't get to see the ledge grab in the replay. That is so unfortunate. But, Chef, this is the type of hero player that is the most dynamic to watch. Because you can play hero as one of the most effective anti-zoning and anti-camping characters in the game as you get a lot of you get to farm for a lot of your most powerful spells and your insane buffs but chef is out here doing something a little bit different they're <laughs> looking for haymakers they're looking for kabooms kamikazes they're looking for the level three zapple uh kazap excuse me they're looking for the high roll, high risk kind of spells where you're using all of your mana for po the potential to kill your opponent at 70. And that's really tantalizing to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, I, I, I agree. And and it's also one of those cases where it's it's an interesting strategy too, because like you said, if you have the tools, you, you can use them in whatever way. And for Chef here to be you know playing that kind of risky style uh it, it means that you know if it works all of a sudden chef's potential to get a bunch of points on the board is massive but this his, one this arrow <laughs> never left kamikaze <laughs> <laughs> it never left he, his heart was set on it they saw the ability to blow themselves up and said this is what i'm doing this is what's happening <laughs> You know, uh, I, I appreciate the commitment because let, let's be honest, I don't think I've seen, like, there are very few heroes here in the EGF. And even, even Weepson here is noting, he's like, I don't want any part of this. I do not want this to go on Twitter. I just, I'm not <laughs> dealing with this. And, uh, oh, we do get it. And then he nearly brought it all back, which was the scary part of this. If you're Chef, all of a sudden that stock going out the window. And no MP on the board after that, uh, oh, what's the name of it? Magic Burst? Magic burst. Yeah, after yeah, the yeah. Magic Burst, there's no MP on you. So you're dependent on just your base kit at that point. And the forward air just Man. barely kind of landing here closes out that first, uh, first game. Just, just hitting the sandals on Dark Pit. As it really felt like we've, we've seen... They had something going for them at the end of this game, finding a whole lot of damage very quickly, a couple very key resets, but the runoff platform forward air was enough to take it. Like it, it it's a lot it's a lot to overcome and a lot you have to mentally process of what is happening in any given moment, given Chef's rather swingy nature, being very loose and fast with his spells and with his MP. But Lilat may prove to be a pretty interesting counterpick. Not only the fact that you get some Smashville esque uh, like platform layouts, to which uh, Weepson used to relatively solid effect, but also 
those slants are going to make excellent defensive positions against uh, against the forward spells on uh, that hero has access to. You're almost cutting that range off and uh, cutting that range in half. We'll have to see, and I do think this is a stage, I mean, we don't typically see a lot of Lilat, but Weepson is one of the players that I think likes this stage in particular, uh, be it comfort or for his character, but oh my goodness, Chef just does not care that forward smash lands and stock number one of Weepson is off the board. You know, usually there's armor on that move, but it doesn't last forever as Chef finds the window with that forward smash. It's... It's a big one, though. The psych up only used on jab, and if you're Weeps in, you absolutely take that. Though there is not much damage being found on Chef's part until that forward air. And Chef right now at one, uh, excuse me, one thirty-nine will be slowly chipped away at here by Weeps in, but that neutral B connects, and now Weeps in at a kind of a very large deficit it has to try and find a way to take this stock here and now because. Again, the raw kill potential of this character. Oh my goodness, that one. Look at the shield pressure that forward smash did. And Weepson now back to the corner. That forwarder connects in. Weepson at 84. We'll get around that first projectile, but still can't quite track down Chef. And Chef doing a very good job here, once again, of controlling stage and managing his MP very well as well. That up tilt won't land, but at 168, if he gets anything on the board here, it's just extra credit. It's gravy on top, 175, and he's still finding a way back to stage until that forward smash lands, and it's tied at stocks, but weeps in at 113. Yeah, spot dodging the first hit, but not getting... Uh, getting intercepted by the second hit as uh, the immediate drop from Halo. You get oomph and a hatchet, man, and that oomph is enough to close out the stock with a forward air, finding Accelerado as well, and we get to see what Chef can really do with that movement, as I love the fact that his, his ha hazard type of play with some of these raw kabooms just trying to chase them down is backed up by a good understanding of what makes heroes so effective on the ground using a lot of jabs uh, down tilts as pokes it's uh, up tilt as it mean to anti-air it's understanding of the character to a point where you feel like you can be a little bit more exotic with your option select right now that option select Great, Oh yeah, no, that was that was huge. She got him off stage with the flame slash. I like the idea, but not gonna connect quite yet. But the pressure, there's a good forward air from Weepson to take that stock off the board. And Chef, well, he was hoping for something out of that menu, but he did not find anything. And all of a sudden the combo coming through here from Weebson, 51 on the chef, uses his jump early, he'll recover low instead, and he'll be able to make it back to stage. But things once again, last stock here, and very close to even Weebson. He finds himself at 91 and in the corner here once again. How does he find his way through? Uh, that's a pretty big opportunity for an opening as a, more of these haymakers keep coming out from Shep. The Kazap, the forward smashes, but weeps in keeping their cool with these arrows, acknowledging the situation that they're in, trying to go for some anti-air up smashes, but nothing finding as the flame slash comes out. Gotta Use be very arrows. careful here. Ooh. Oh, didn't complete the wreck of his Air Force. They got, uh, they missed the chance for a grab, but that's a full combo. And with only six mana on, they have enough for a whoosh, and that's about it. Yeah, they... Oh, what a tech! As they do get back to stage, but they're running low. That could have been a grab. That could have been a forward throw. But weeps in bait, expecting a roll, but did not give it. As the game continues. 134 to 125 now. Weeps in the corner. That down B will buy a little bit of time. I like the attempt on the down air there, but he doesn't have enough MP to recover. Ends up SDing and Weeps and takes game two. We're headed to game three. After a walk, after a wild start, a wild and rockin' start, got crossed between my words. Weeps in played the end of that game phenomenally with the slightly wider stage and the difference of platforms they had no uh, they did not worry about these runoff fares and poor mp usage that is kind of been 
what uh, the Achilles heel on Chef at times. When everything was working, they had enough MP in order to use some of those big haymakers. But at the start of the game, as unfortunately we got a, you get a glimpse of the weirdo armor thing on Dark Pit. Yeah. Uh, so just to cut off my tangent for a little bit, Dark Pit's armor on the Electroshock arm starts when he begins his swing. Uh, ends, excuse me, ends when he begins his swing, which that must have been the very start of it, as unfortunate as that is. But either way, the great sense of advantage after a long first stock on Weebson's part really got them, it got him control of the game when it mattered most. Yeah, there was. It was interesting too that the game kind of ended with Chef having no MP because through the first two stocks, it felt like he had so much in the tank that, <clears throat> excuse me, Weebson had to play so carefully around all the spells that could possibly have come out. But then on this last stock, he's playing with you know maybe thirty-ish or so for the majority of his final stock here. This was a great turnaround and catch by uh, Weebson to get things back to even. But here you see Chef just gets a little greedy, and you have to wonder, too, if he just charged that up B for too long. If that's an instant input kind of move, maybe it gets him back. I'm not 100% sure how much that up B actually uses in terms of the, the number of MP, but... It was very, very close, and I don't mind the attempt at a down air because that was actually one of the first times that Weepson, I think, in that scenario specifically, had recovered high with the side B. So just kind of a, a mix-up and an unfortunate circumstance there for the side uh, of Chef. But that being said, game number three between these two and a pivotal one, Kalos is the site, and we'll see what these two players bring to the table. So, hey. Uh, to answer your question, as we see on Kalos, because it will matter, it always ends up mattering. The up B, uh, Woosh, the Woosh series, uh, level 1 costs 5 MP, level 2 costs 12, I believe, and, oh, excuse me, not, uh, not 12, 9, and level 3 costs 18. He ended this stock uh, with, or the, the game ended with 15 MP on Chef's part. So they had enough for level two, but charged it a little bit too long as they felt as they went for the level three to guarantee the recovery. You have to know your MP costs, and it shows on the menu, but it does not show for your normal suite of specials. And that's something for Chef to keep track of uh, as this set. And for Wilson, you have to MP. be able to. Yeah. Uh, you have to be able to keep in mind just how much MP are they burning. And while Chef has been playing, will be will sometimes play with a normal set sense of what, how much you can use and how much you can afford. There will be times when he's throwing out like uh, options that cost him almost 40 MP, which is a lot, especially when it's getting reflected back in your face. I'm actually shocked that down B came out so quickly. I thought the, the second he put it away, he might have gotten hit by that neutral B, but the down B comes out in time and Weebson takes the first stock. And that's something that's been a rare occasion here for Kinesius. They've been the ones through the past two sets trying to battle back after losing the first stock. And so now we'll see what they can do with the lead here. See if they can get any extra credit on the board or will Chef be able to answer back quickly as Weebson those combos are starting to add up, but the back air connects well spaced once again, and Chef even th evens things back up. Yeah, you you definitely have to space that back air very well, and it, Chef has been doing so. It may be a slow move, but it, no shortage of power. As 39% of peace until that back air landed on Weebson's part, trying to regain their sense of control. They have plenty of stage until they gave up a lot of it to shoot that arrow, and we're back at. We're back at neutral. This, the way that they uh, Weebson has been dashing in and out really abuses Sh uh, Chef playing a slow character as the Electroshock arm breaks through the back air. I like the idea to break through neutral there from Weebson. Chef here at 88 around the ledge. He'll be able to roll back to stage, but Weebson continuing to 
chip away at this stock. That being said, Downer nearly connecting into that up smash, a dangerous turnaround there from Chef. And both of these players trying very carefully here, work their way around this stock. The sizzle gonna get reflected once again. Weebson, those reflex really coming in clutch here in game number three. Yeah, they might want to focus on having bounce a little bit more, not only for the potential to re-reflect some of the things that are bounced back at him, but also for these Dark Pit arrows that have been a real thorn in Chef's side. As there goes a ton of mana and a clear opening for Weebson, which they take all the way up into 69.6% .6 and climbing. It was a huge opening, like you said, and Weebson was there capitalized so nearly 80 percent on the board and now chef has to find a way to respond here again kind of looking for him uh, excuse me looking for a way to buy some time he's used these spells very well but like you said the mp usage ever present in this matchup and we is at 122 percent but here's another opening he's got him up in the sky but he can't quite juggle him for long enough that up air connects but it won't do it quite yet the sizzle he'll just send that the other way as the reflect was ready for weeps and once again that neutral b is going to beat out that arrow though just in time and all of a sudden it's last stock huge opportunity for chef on their part as they charge back up the kafriz yet again and it really seems like weeps in the reaction as soon as they see a menu or as soon as they are landing at all the downbeat is coming out which those guardian orbiters are much more than just reflectors they also block out opponents making them also making uh, it hard to attack from the side as a near sd comes in from chef so a, uh, some great sense of ledge play with these arrows pecking away up one, two, and a third, but not finding it and not finding zoom either. The wow. snipes, the snipes there from Weepson time and time again. And he found his opening, that forward throw, nearly getting the stock and then realizing, hey, there's nothing left in the tank here for Chef. Just arrow after arrow after arrow was enough. And like you said, Chef's last chance here does he pull up Zoom and nope, nothing on the board. Could not find a way back. So it is Weebson taking the third set here. Minimum points earned, but it was very close. And it does put the pressure here on Iona to find a way to respond here. And I mean, this was really very, very close, but I feel like the difference maker, there were two things that stuck out in my mind. Number one, the reflex. They were you know, a huge factor because they not only took two of the three stocks, but also uh, the Nairs just kept landing and it, it, the menu once again is not... <laughs> uh, yeah, no zoom. <laughs> oh man, I gotta, I gotta use this Telestrator more. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough it's a tough one and you actually have so heroes menu functions in a bizarre and infinitely awkward way um the the chance for certain spells to come up is not equal you're more you're more often going to see spells like uh sizz oh. and bang rather than the leveled up versions of the spells you're going to see uh bounce very very frequently and zoom, you won't see it much on stage, but when you are past a certain point off stage, zoom comes up a lot more frequently. Yet in the blast zone, as deep as Chef was, zoom did not show up. And to be quite honest, for many of the opportunity, for much of the menu usage as Chef used, he got rather unlucky <laughs> throughout the throughout the set. Yeah, I mean, through all the times that he, you know, had a lot of those high potential... Yeah, no, the, I mean, this was, was they say, with the reflex, that just Weepson's reflex just came through time and time again. And for the for the times that uh, Chef had the MP to possibly come up with Zoom, Zoom really did never come up for him. And so that, that, that gambling style that Chef seemed to like ended up 
being the the nail in the coffin for him in this set. The other thing that caught my eye, and I started to to make this point, um, but it was the the nares. In in game one, you saw Weebson tried to catch uh, Chef recovering with early air dodges or trying to catch a double jump with the nair with that multi hit because again, hero off stage doesn't have a whole ton of options. It's a pretty readable recovery. So it was a good idea, but they never landed through the first parts of that set. As the set went on, those nairs started to connect a whole lot more. And we've seen, you know, once, you know, you get this hero off stage, the edge guards started to really come through. And that ability to secure stocks is, is something that a lot of these uh, teams at the top of the EGF have done really well. The ability to, to clean up edge guards and just not allow your team to, or allow your opponent to to come back to stage, to try and mount that comeback. That's uh, It's something worth noting. And it was really, I think, impressive to watch that adaptation from Weebson. Yeah, it was a battle of consistency versus inconsistency, and at the end of the day, how it usually happens, despite inconsistency potentially leading you to higher highs, uh, consistency wins out in these best of threes as Weebson closes out the game with, uh, I want to really point out his magnificent arrow usage. Not only was the amazing in the last stock being able to peck away at, uh, at Chef with dark pit arrows, which do not have a lot of uh, you are unable to influence their direction as much as normal pit arrows, but he was. they found their mark time and time again and interrupted Chef both on stage and off, and it was a really good way to maintain tempo, even with those edge guards attempts, as you were mentioning, so I just able to push themselves off stage, but still have an on stage presence. Yeah, and... Uh... That was a, a huge difference maker. And with that, the score now 10 to six. So it's only a only a four point difference. That's the minimum amount of points you can earn in a in a set, assuming you don't give up any points. So one set could you know still even things back up. And that being said, even if Canisius were to earn the minimum amount of points, it wouldn't be out of the woods for Iona. So it really does put a lot of emphasis on this fourth set. It's also worth noting, we've talked in the past um, uh, about Iona as a team. They like to send in the heavy hitters early in the lineup, or at least that would seem to be the game plan throughout the fall split is, OK, let's see if we can wrap this up early and then we'll you know, give our, our depth of our lineup some time in the spotlight and see if they can they can hold on. That doesn't seem to be the case today. We haven't seen a lot of the heavy hitters that Iona has typically brought out. We haven't seen Moat, who's been a huge player. We haven't seen Kibbs or uh, Lofts even, are, you know, those names that we've seen time and time again be at the, the, the start of that lineup. And now we're in set number four where, you know, it's going to be very difficult uh, if those players don't come in. It's, it's just interesting to note that, you know, Iona is putting a lot of emphasis in a very pivotal matchup on players that haven't seen the spotlight yet. It's a interesting, uh, interesting analysis, and I'm very uh, curious to see what Iona's plan is as we get down to the nitty gritty in a set that is probably going to come down to the very last game of the very last set in order to determine where these points sway one way or another. As Moat, the player you mentioned, Moat is going to come up against Flapjack for uh, Canisius and Iona. Ooh, this is, <laughs> it looks like it is a battle of, um, it is going to be the captain for Canisius in Flapjack trying to extend this lead and secure, potentially secure a victory. Because you get four points, if you get a massive win here, if you're flapjack, that could be ice. That could be icing the game before even going to the final set. Yeah, I'm excited for this matchup in particular because these are really, I think, the two kind of biggest names uh, for each school, respectively. Flapjack seven and two on the season. He is the team captain. He is kind of the 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 guy, the go-to guy for the Golden Griffins, and has been for really the last two seasons. So if there's anyone that could ice a game for the Griffs, it would be Flapjack on this Krom. 
on the flip side, Moat has been one of the scariest players for this Iona roster, uh, playing against the uh, the, uh, the the fighting game characters. He, he's played Terry and Kazuya uh, mostly this season, and those are characters that yes, they are <laughs> uh, the uh, essentially Moat has been one of the scariest players because these characters are so explosive, right? If they you know, find their three openings, your stock just gets deleted seemingly out of nowhere. But you have to win those three kind of neutral interactions to get to that point. So to, and against a, a Krom, that's a very interesting matchup because Krom can also have his explosive moments with his speed, with a couple of those uh, quick moves that he has, things like forward tilt and so on and so forth. This is a very, I think we're, we're here for some fireworks in this matchup. Absolutely, and every time you see either Ken, Ryu, well, not so much Ryu, but Ken, Terry, and Kazuya on screen, sparks are flying. Like in <laughs> one, in a manner of speaking, but also in the case of Ken, quite literally. The <laughs> interesting part about it, though, is as you mentioned, Terry and Kazuya almost take the same kind of twin-headed role that Ryu and Ken do. Ryu being a lot more. Uh, planted and slow paced using a lot of fireballs for effective zoning and and counter zoning whether it be the haruken or the shakunetsu while ken is all about what they can do off of a single opening making up tech chases and like blowing you up with a massive shoryuken kazuya does that same type of thing though with a lot more steps because kazuya just has a lot more tools to, to be available but the tech chasing and the prowess of kazuya the demon make form can take your stock not on three, not on two, but just one interaction if played right. Terry's a little bit different though. Terry plays a lot more neutral and is a lot better against swords. As we see in this match, Terry can be a lot more calm and collected and you can play to a more defensive game with your own level of shenanigans as we saw immediately come out was the true input power dunk which is plus on block by the way so flapjot is gonna really need to make use of Krom's insane speed as they start right off the bat jumping over with a plenty of these up airs and back airs Ooh, but the damage evens up just like that <laughs> that is what is so scary these characters in particular it feels like they only need one or two opening to really just get the damage going something you'll note too about flapjack's movement in particular he loves to mix up the, his approaches and the way he moves in the air with those side bees to try and i believe wave bounce and just you know it, it's another kind of wrinkle to his game plan that we've seen a couple times early on in this first stock as power dunk nearly taking that first stock off the board flapjack at 137 here mode at 90 good down tilt to get him away but with go online this is getting scary that power guys are gonna be shielded flapjack able to get out of that scenario for now that ooh, that's an air dodge not an up b and he won't be able to grab the ledge so moat will drop the first stock Oh, but not able to SDI out of the power dunk as we're they're sitting at 173 looking for the up smash, but not finding it. Flapjack it is at a ton of damage, but is able to bypass every, almost every single one of these power dunks until the very last one at 190, which is never what you want to be taking a stock as an as a fighting game rep player. It'll be It'll be tough for sure to see how Mo overcomes this because Krom, as fast as Krom can be, Krom's defensive game is just as powerful as their offensive game since they don't have to worry about sweet spots or sour spots. They can just get away with exceeding speed and maintain the space of their big sword with the greatest of ease. Right now, Flapjack still at a deficit here. Ooh, but I love that mix up there. Getting the, the uh, what was it, Nair into the side B uh, Buster Wolf, and Flapjack nearly losing the stock for it. And that's something that Moat has also been very good at, connecting those down tilts into kind of mix ups to try and catch his opponent, uh, excuse me, opponent off guard. And nearly finding a combo of his own there was Flapjack, but that power dunk will kill him off the top of the screen. So Flapjack on his last stop. 
I like that a lot because he didn't go for the true in. Uh, he didn't go for the true input. He went for the uh, the light input in, in, in order to not go nearly as high and prevent from flapjack from SDIing out as easily. Up the. Ooh, I didn't, that has armor. Uh, oh my goodness, and Moat did not come to mess around, and no, that <laughs> Flapjack is not okay. The Buster Wolf connects, the and, Buster uh, Wolf broke the arena. <laughs> it, it, it might have. It might actually have, because, uh, Flapjack will lose his stock here either way. Moat, a two-stock victory, uh, in game wow. number one, and what a turnaround from Moat. Seemingly was was i mean he was off stage on that second stock and two interactions flapjack was deceased in that moment so what a what a quick turnaround from Mo and this is what we were talking about with how explosive these characters are moats at 105 that go comes online you better be ready for it and uh flapjack was not in this case let's get a nice we'll get a nice look at yeah there it is Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, jokes aside, as Smash Ultimate Online can be an inconsistent beast, the play from Moat after an SD at the beginning and after a tight game where it really was Flapjack dominating much of the stage, Moat did what what these FGC characters and what Terry does best, which is just be so unbelievably potent without sacrificing in terms of damage and combos, without sacrificing the uh, the flexibility in neutral. Terry moves extremely well, has a really good grab and dash attack suite for of grounded options. And when it comes to uh, grounded options up close, down tilts and for down tilt and forward tilt are so unbelievably powerful. Not to mention that jab of being great pressures on great pressure on shield, easily confirmable combos out of all of them. And forward tilt, as much as we make a stink out of Krom's sword and sorties in general, Terry's forward tilt is disjointed. So whatever he put into those genes, it is doing work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I mean, and also, I think there's also something to note about certain play styles, too. Um, one thing that I think has benefited, it, it makes me think back to the A Fly set we saw in uh, the very first set of this matchup, is that, you know, Game Watch can kind of benefit from playing that defensive play style, from, you know, uh, just kind of shielding those first couple attacks and then punishing with something like Up B. And Flapjack, I think, is one of those players that, he tends to lean that way at first. He's got those, you know, out of shield options, things like up be out of shield, things like forward tilt out of shield, things like down tilt. He has those also quick options that work. But against Terry, I don't think they quite work as well as as you saw in that very first game. Terry was the one, or Moat was the one really, you know, pressuring the shield. And then there was no punish once Flapjack dropped his shield. It was just more yeah. pressure and yeah. there were, really wasn't an answer in time for the side of flapjack yeah we didn't see any of the soaring slash out of shield any sort of like respect my space respect my disjoint like get off me moat was just allowed to run up and perform his block strings poke with down tilt twice over get a jab one two a pressure with a four tilt perhaps like all of that was just free reign and if you're not able to respect that disjoint if you're not able to force your opponent to respect that, then that's when you see Terry players neutral get up from ledge and treat the forward input of neutral get up as the first input needed for Buster Wolf, of which they come immediately back onto stage with. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's so it, it is devastating how Terry can play into so many matchups so effectively for having as high of a ceiling for having as high of a punish game as he does. But in speaking of punish games, to take it out of the game for just a moment and to bring you back to the players, there's some shenanigans going on a little bit because the disconnect that happened was on the part of Moat. 
Interesting. Uh, well, I, I think we'll be... I, I think at that point the, the Buster Wolf connected, so I think the, that the results of Game 1 will will stand and uh, we'll be able to play on from there. But, you know, it, an unfortunate circumstance when those internet issues happen. Uh, but that is... I mean, that is the world we live in. These online matchups, they, they've got to be played at some point, and so... Uh, I believe the results of, of game number one will stand. So when we as we get ready for game number two, uh, what do you think Flapjack needs to do? Uh, are there is there anything you're looking at? I guess in particular that he needs to do to kind of work his way back in this in this specific matchup. I touched on it a little bit before, but Crom has a hey, Crom plays differently from Roy. Like just because they're Echo fighters doesn't mean that you have to play the same kind of rush down high rolly style that Roy tends to subscribe to because you are looking to get those sweet spots. Crom doesn't have to worry about that because he has no sweet spots. It's just one sword. So you can use that speed to play evasive, to dash back a lot, to utilize Crom's slight differences that they don't put on normal frame data. Uh, for instance, uh, Crom is a taller model. He's a taller man, he's a man compared to Roy, who I think is literally 14. So <laughs> they made him taller. And as of that, his arms are longer. And as of that, his forward tilt reaches further. You don't, and as addition to the stance that they hold at, uh, Roy holds it reverse grip while Krom does not. There's little differences. Oftentimes makes Krom's moves not only be, uh, reach a little bit farther than Roy's does, and that natural, those slight natural differences in model make Krom not only have a more consistent saber, but also a longer reach more often than not. And on a stage like Kalos, you can play into that defense. Play to your character's strengths and don't try and just give Moat the opportunity to run in and do whatever they want. Though you, you still have to look out for those massive uh, power dunks in mid-screen. We saw so, actually one of those power dunks take the first stock of uh, game number one on Flapjack. If you remember, he was caught jumping a little bit too high and he ended up dying at 191. So uh, it seems like at the start, Flapjack doing a decent job of keeping up the speed, but he is at 80% right now. Yeah, they're just getting a little bit too... Con too concerned about following up with their hits. Sometimes all you're gonna get is a back air, and that's okay because it's great just to land that one hit and to not worry about getting hit by a show by an FGC rep by this Terry. But that back air will push Moat far too far in order to recover, and the uh, the patient the set is now in Flapjack's favor to control as we get a jab into the double edge dance. And I think he's starting to catch on to what you were saying. Just a couple of, you know, you know, one hit and then dip out. There is a good combo started there with that falling up air. Wanted that next forward air, got it, and then tried to overextend and got punished for it. So a very, uh, you know, uh, something to look at as this set goes on. A very keen observation on, on your part. Now, Moat is the one at disadvantage, but he is able to quickly answer back. Down tilt into the side B cleans up that stock and well things 40. are back to even a two they have 40 real quick and oh even more 77, 77. <laughs> this, <laughs> is, this is the scary part of, the, of those fighting of those uh was it shoto characters i i end up calling them aimbot characters but I, <laughs> oh the forward tilt gonna connect there and uh stock number two off the board of mo that's really one of the first forward tilts we've seen cleanly connect and take stock yeah, they're getting these up, these falling up airs at max range, and that uh, the side B is to stall mid air and to manipulate their momentum, as you mentioned in the pregame, are coming really in handy for Flapjack, but they just get caught overextending ever so slightly, or getting caught like holding shield for just a little bit too long, and get in spots like that where those rolls are very dangerous to go for, dropping shield at just the wrong time, but not finding the stop. Is, uh, is Moat, but that should do it. Just the one down tilt to pop up Flapjack into the burning knuckle. Parry there was massive too to 
Leave him vulnerable in time for that side beat. Ooh, great catch there, but the forward tilt not going to land. Chance for more percent. Wanted to read a roll there, but could not find it. Mode is at 92, and this is where things get dangerous. There's Go, but Mode is off stage. Can he find a way back? Just barely able to grab that ledge and weave his way around that forward tilt. And Mode has made it back to stage, but the pressure just continues here from Flapjack on the, the tech chase, and the forward air will clean it up. So Flapjack able to respond in game number two. Very, very nice stuff on their part, just being able to confidently say, all right, I'm going to look for my starters and I'm going and look and go for my starters. But at the end of the day, what makes this stage so good is the utilization of these ledges. Not only there where Flapjack just gets a simple and clean runoff forward air on the crack shoot, but also in this very exact situation, covering these platforms, covering the ledge covering the ledge whether or not moat wants to go high or low it is very very good for quick characters to cover multiple options just by being stand just by standing there and playing reactionary which flapjack slowly but surely subscribed to as this uh, as the game went on yeah it's like you said in that very first uh stock there it was it was read react right it was okay he used the side b before his jump okay i'll be right here with the back air oh he's used his jump i'm gonna be right here with another back air and uh that's what really ended up ta uh, ended up taking that first stock and yeah that that uh you know like you said this stage and and flapjack playing a little bit more defensive really benefited him here as yeah the walk back to avoid any type of get up attack and then the quick forward <laughs> tilt there wait wait hold on uh, i want to i want to wind it back just a little bit i'm gonna okay so i gotta wind it forward now so we're, we're gonna move <laughs> forward we're gonna move forward he grabs ledge he gets up normal stuff i'm gonna rewind it just a little bit i believe this frame before he gets hit this frame is the first frame of buster wolf Oh, oh my god, I am desynced <laughs> completely. Okay. Uh, my, <laughs> I believe this neutral get up here is the first frame of Buster Wolf comes out before getting swatted away. Uh, my mistake, but either way, it is. it was great play on Flapjack's part just to keep it steady and to not let anything get out of hand. I play it as they play it how Krom can be played and not just try to play as you want to play. So right here when he's so. done getting up. Oh yeah, no, that that's the start of something there. That's the start of a move. And then he gets chopped in half. <laughs> that's, wow, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's just, I mean, that's the danger of Krom, right? That forward tilt is so quick and that coverage is is so clean. I will say, Moat did a very good job of recovering back to stage. For limited options, Sorry. and uh, for limited options just in general, and being able to say, you're right, like, if he misses up, or excuse me, messes up that spacing on the up B to ledge at all, it's an instant forward tilt from flat, Flapjack, and that's just the stock. So he has to perfectly space that up B back to ledge every single time, and he did when he had the opportunity to do so, but he did not have the opportunity to do so on this last stock as seen here. It's probably a pretty good change of pace for Krom players when they don't really have to worry about their recovery getting snuffed out and can routinely snuff out their opponents instead. Uh, and you're exactly right. The the ball is always going to be in, uh, in Moat's court whether or not they are recovering successfully because if they mess up even a little bit a down tilt is very easily to come out and poke and poke terry away game number three between these two final destination the site and uh this is this is a very uh well final destination i always say it's the double-edged sword of stages you can get a lot out of your advantage or you could end up losing your stock while in disadvantage so we'll have to see between these two again a very explosive matchup and things off to a hot start as both already a high percent and flapjack having to air dodge back to stage Ooh, he 
Some of these conversions, Moat tries to take their time a little bit more, but getting the roll read, yet popping out is Flapjack. Final Destination is a very, very tough stage to play against the FGC reps on. You have to play a little bit more of their game, but this juggle doesn't last as long as Flapjack wanted, not making up all of the percent difference. Is that gonna do it? No, it's not quite yet. When I like that side B, actually, you saw it kind of changed his momentum, pushed him away, and all of a sudden there's a, a large gap of distance between him and Moat, and he's able to safely grab ledge because of it. That dash attack will not connect, and the side B will, so Moat able to take that first stock off the board. Yeah, getting a little too, uh, too eager with a button out of shield and getting blasted for it. Though the down tilt tech chase into the forward tilt is going to be huge, yet not pulling the trigger on a forward air as Moat has access to Buster Wolf, though great DI in order to force a tech situation and miss the tech to not get hit by the Buster Wolf as the runoff forward air does take it that time. 56 right now on Flapjack, continuing to rack up here as he tries to find a way to land. He will get a grab, but doesn't get anything off of it. Those landing forward air is very dangerous. That up B will not connect, and this is a bunch of damage headed Flapjack's way as that up B gets him up to 114. No follow-up on that side B from Flapjack, but he does get, I believe, did he catch Moat's jump? He did for a moment there and was able to get a, a string of his own, but Flapjack has to be very careful here. 115, and Terry's got so much kill power in his kit. 136 now, he's able to get back to stage. Moat has opened up a very, very devastating uh, trifecta on off of this jab 1-2, or usually down tilt jab 1-2. The usual 50-50 is the uh, either going for the rising tackle or the, uh, the power dunk, off of these jabs as the forward smash almost connects on the di on the uh, uh chain, but a burn knuckle close out the stock close no once again oh, oh sorry go ahead <laughs> go, go for it like the the only thing i was gonna say is now gone by the wind with that stock gone on flapjack part and 116 on moat right now again just barely able to snap back to ledge i get up attack two also pushing Flapjack away with Go Online. You can tell Moat wants this stock. If he gets two stocks on the board, it could be big, but Go is going to be offline as the edge guard comes through once again. Flapjack has evened things up, and it's down to a last stock scenario here in Game 3. Has to be careful with choosing his punishes here. Playing this offstage game goes for the roll, but Moat is, covers that with the auto turnaround and a back air to boot. Well, what will find this closing a falling up air is huge. A loss of a jump, but Moat comes down aggressively. That's, that's a big way to maintain this which as the short and wow, holy, super died. And the change up that comes with Terry. I mean, we can talk about uh, the change up that comes with a lot of the FGC characters. We can talk about the individual specials as they are like just singular moves but terry does have technically four ways that he can input power dunk the not true input where he's just inputting down b as well as the uh, a tap instead of a hold so it's the light version holding it so it's a heavy version or the true input tap for the true input light version or the true input heavy version as right there True input light version did not go nearly as high and still came down right on Flapjack's head. I'm actually shocked because I know that that Krom up B has got a little bit of armor to it. I'm not sure when that armor exactly comes out here, but that ended up being the, the, the demise of him is that I guess that armor did not come out quite in enough time and uh uh, Moat uh, able to take advantage and take that stock, take game three, and now it all depends on that last stock. But this was really a, a very close matchup. This could have turned at really any point from a very, you know, from a... Uh, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to say because it's one of those things where it was so close between these two. But there were moments both ways where it could have easily become a massive victory for both teams. Look at the forward smash there. How not, did he miss? Not catching the toes of Terry there. 
and, and even on that last stock too, you saw Flapjack try and line up another forward smash and the forward air just barely connecting in time before the start of that swing came out. Those were two massive turning points for, for Flapjack that could have turned this set on its head. And Moat is the one that also, you know, had a big stock lead throughout the majority of these games, but couldn't put it away. Flapjack found a, a way to respond. Even here, the second he drops shield is the moment the move comes out. It was literally, if this were if this were traditional sports, it, it'd be a game of inches. But this is esports. This was a game of frames between these two. Huh. That must have been the very moment he rolled or dropped shield or something because that shield was full. But, I mean, it was good on moat right they had their punish game on point they were finding their conversions however simple as they were uh, i mean jab jab power dunk has been memed into oblivion because it's not exactly difficult to perform but it's incredibly effective i mean there it's incredibly effective as a confirm on its own and moat found many a ways to find openings on its own as Wow, the sweep missed on the Soaring Slash and got uh, pounded upon. Usually the armor ceases uh, once Krom starts rising, so he must have just begun his leap into the air. Holy moly, what a, what a close <laughs> game. On uh, Despite percents like swaying and maybe not always telling the full tale, we really felt like both players had a sense of what to do in a matchup like this and if we ran this exact same set back one more time it could have a completely different outcome it was very very close and again i i mean i'm excited to see what these teams bring down the line because there is a, there is a possible scenario where these two may play each other in the first round of the playoffs so it is, it's going to be fun to watch if that ends up being the occasion. But that being said, fifth set coming up, a tied scoreline means the win or loss rides on the next two players. I believe we have them locked in. For Iona, it is going to be Rat King, who is a... Uh, <laughs> I, I always hesitate when, when I say, I, I don't like talking about the tier lists of characters, but Rat King seems to be the king of the low tiers. We've seen him play Little Mac. We've seen him play, I believe, King Dedede in the past. Uh, king K. Rule, I believe, as well. Uh, Bowser Jr., another one in his lineup. Uh, so characters that we don't see a lot of time in the spotlight on. Meanwhile, for the side of Canisius, I believe this is Jabari getting locked in. A snake player, uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, for the side of Canisius. So, and someone that we really haven't seen get a lot of time this season. I believe this is the, his first match of the spring split in general. So, uh, a very different type of matchup. And I'm curious to see what these two players bring to the table in a really a high stakes set. Yeah, I mean, it's winner take all here. 11-11. It is going to be the it's going to be decided here based on the play of these two players and no other outside factors. Uh, well, no other outside <laughs> bracket factors. There is still Smash <laughs> Ultimate online to take advantage of. But we've got Young Link and Little Mac coming up to this stage. And while you could argue to and fro about some of the characters you mentioned, whether or not Bowser Jr. is really low tier, whether K. Rule is really a low tier, you know, all that good stuff. You know, arguments abound. Ultimate's a really balanced game. Little Mac is generally considered the low tier. Uh, not the, the play of players like Alternus and uh, Peanut getting so much recognition. Uh, this, it's a... a it's a character that is so easily exploited despite all of their strengths and the fact that the way they're exploited is just part of the game, being in the air. <laughs> of course, Young Link is not exactly the most... It is a character that finds it hard to be so dominating of other characters, especially when you're moving like Rat King is. That up smash connecting and taking the first stock and Rat King really has not been touched much this 
stock in particular, only 45 to his name now, a couple of hits connecting on Jabari's second stock here. KO Punch also coming online, something that Jabari will have to worry about. And this young Link, all the projectiles really doing a lot of work, I would say, but Rat King, oh, that KO Punch whiffed, didn't get the quite the right tech read there. And so that opportunity goes by the wayside, but Rat King doing a very good job here on this first stock. The Z-Drop Bomb was huge in order to proc the counter and find a great punish. And you don't need anything too fancy to force a Little Mac outside the reach of his recovery. What looks like a very tough game to come back from is now well within Jabari's reach if they find a proper opening. Though, oftentimes they're playing the Zone Breaker as Young Link, who's not traditionally seen as a character that approaches with gusto. Yet here we are, Jabari taking leaps and bounds going in with these projectiles to cover more or less to cover space and then boxing with young Link's incredible it's incredible double parry on the up smash intentional parries that you saw the shield come up and then punishing with the strongest move in little max arsenal that was a crazy parry uh double parry like you said by rat king into that KO punch, which took the first or second stock off of Jabari, but Jabari was able to answer back with an up smash, so things just about dead even here on the last stock between these two. And I don't know, this one's very dangerous for both players. Is Rat King that percent starting to really rack up? He's off stage. The arrow connects the early side beat. KO punch is online though. This is where Jabari has to be very careful here. If this KO punch lands, that's it. This game is done, dusted, and over. But he stalls it out long enough. So he's bought himself some extra time here. He's at 81. And Little Mac, if there's anything he does, he punches hard. A one strong hit could do it really either way here. The foreigner connects, and that's gonna be game one. Jabari takes it. Okay, so, you know, hitboxes aside, as this forward air does find a way to connect, Jabari was playing that very well after a haphazard start to the game where Rat King was able to just do what Little Mac does best and armor through things. Instead of playing into the reach that Young Link has as, sure, yeah, that, that forward air hit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it did. So there's there's something I I've noted about some of the link character uh, at least for uh, n just new normal or neutral like whatever you want to call it, just link his his sword things like his upbeat they have that kind of like pull box like the upbeat pulls you inward once you get hit by well one slash of it I almost feel like they all kind of have that effect at, at certain points where it just that, that inner hitbox, it's there. It doesn't feel like it should be there, but it is there, and Jabari was uh, able to find it there on that last stock. Yeah, it's it exists most obviously on Adult Link, uh, not only with the, ups, uh, the up special, but also as great play on, on, uh, on Rat King's part to tangent yet again. But yes, young Adult Link has these moments where the sword becomes active before he starts really swinging you can notice it on adult links forward tilt as well as on young links forward tilt where the sword really becomes a hitbox as it's at the peak uh, as it's at the start of its arc downward not necessarily when it's in front of young link which means it can start hitting a little bit behind you forward is not usually one of those moves though the fact that it was in between hits one and two means that the hitbox was just active within Young Link a, a little bit deeper than we gave him credit for. Well, either way, I think Jabari will take it as he has oh, yeah. taken game number one. Battlefield, the site of game number two, and Jabari, I think he's feeling confident that dash dance is center stage, showing off a little bit of movement, and Rat King will have to find a way to respond here. Is it a little bit of a, an early percent deficit, but you saw doesn't mean much when KO Punch comes online and when you've got so much armor. Look at that percent get even right back up. The ground smash will not connect. That forward smash nearly finding the stock. And now this is where things get dangerous. Once again, that KO Punch, did that get interrupted by the boomerang? I think it just whiffed, but also then was immediately punished by the boomerang. Though then up till into an upbeat, but no 
dice on no dice on the kill from the up B, but if your opponent is insisting on landing directly on you, what a gentleman. What an absolute gentleman. Just waiting, letting the misinput go without a punish, and then getting killed for it. <laughs> A crazy <laughs> string of interactions between these two. Just the the super armor of of all of these moves, really, from Little Mac and and Racking just in general. Uh, it's it, it's just punch for punch, really, between these two. But Racking seems to be hitting just a tad bit harder, and Jabari is feeling the pressure of it. Eighty five percent on him, and Racking only at seventy four. But the second he's on those platforms. There's not much Rat King can do when he loses a KO punch for it. Yeah, all it takes is one hit, uh, one means of putting Little Mac into tumble in order to get rid of that KO punch. But on a platform like that, and 97 after the hit, it doesn't take much with that grounded up B to close the stock on Battlefield. As Rat King looking to even up this game and even even up the game count and even up the score, perhaps even in a two stock, which would put his team in the lead. Gotta play carefully here as not a lot of moves connecting here for Jabari, but it is a lot of pressure. 130 on Rat King right now and playing around those platforms very carefully. And Rat King right now, I think this is playing to his favor. He's trying to stall out. He's trying to get that KO punch back online, but he's got to be very careful about it. The jab connects. Good counter on the boomerang to get back to stage. And the percent starting to rack up here on Jabari. He's at 54. Just two more arrows before KO Punch comes back online here. Those projectiles, Rat King starting to shield them more and more here. Jabari starting to swing for the fences. And can he find something off this platform? Wanted to read a roll, but could not do so. J or, excuse me, Rat King playing very patient. Good arrow. And I like the ideas from both players there. And Jabari is the one who ends up escaping because of it. Oh! <laughs> The step back forward smash from Rat King saying, where are you going? And it is that two stock victory for Rat King in game number two. That's absolutely huge. Not only was his gameplay very, very well done, uh, Rat King playing this runaway Little Mac, like taking taking a page out of Muhammad Ali's book, just this outboxing style that utilized the platforms to great advantage, just ducking away from the ducking away from the projectiles and finding ways to get back onto from one side of the stage to another, not to mention a great anti-air. But also winning by two stocks means the score doesn't even up at 12 to 12, but rather Iona takes the lead at 13-12. While this isn't a huge difference because two points are still awarded to the winner of the set, it means that there is a possibility here that winning by one stock isn't enough. Is that, that is, true? uh, no, it is that's that's not, not, not not quite the case. But I will say, that <laughs> I <laughs> no no worries. It's <laughs> no information allowed. No misinformation allowed. <laughs> Well, math, math is hard. It, 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 it's it true. It is. This is a, this is a weird this is a weird format too. It's not a traditional crew battle where it's just you know stock for stock. It's it's you know points are based off of off of the set count. But what what I do think does matter here in a two stock fashion is that it's a huge momentum shift because of every game that we've seen for the past what three sets has really been stock for stock, punch for punch. So for uh, Rat King to have a two stock victory in the most crucial part of the set. Jabari now, I think, is really starting to feel the pressure, and we're about to see if his mental game is on point or not in the very last match between these two schools. Winner of this game takes the W for the week. Yeah. Winner take all for sure, and I, if you're Jabari, you need to find ways that are a little bit safer and or, and a little bit more conducive to playing against a little Mac than just hunting for some your starters and ways to combo off of them. Rat King just sometimes does not care using the extremely low jab and pulling uh, the trigger on these smash attacks early. 
trying to take advantage, reading the counter very well done on Jabari's part in order to attempt to close out the stock, but the bomb was sent the wrong way. It looked like Jabari wanted another forward air, but could not find it based on the angle he was sent. 134 on Rat King right now, no KO punch either. You saw him burn it earlier, this stock, down tilt lands, no up smash there. And Jabari gotta be careful, that up B, it does connect the down tilt into the up B. That's something that Rat King has been very good at as this set has gone on about. Good parry and he'll armor through, and now the extra credit really starting to ramp up here. Jabari trying to find a way to answer, but he's already at 60%. The hits just keep on trucking through every attempt from Jabari here. And KO Punch is almost back online as well. Rat King trying to stall out for it. That's the up tilt. KO Punch is here. Jabari has to be very careful. He is at, well, KO percent at 66. And Rat King is at 63. But there goes KO Punch. And Jabari will buy himself a little bit of time. But as I say that, he eats another up smash. And he's at 98 percent. Oh no, that's the stock for sure. The up B missed input, and the up B of Rat King takes it, and all of a sudden, Jabari's gonna have to fully reverse sweep Rat King to take this one back. That's a yeah, dead little Mac. But <laughs> it is still a long way to go, and Jabari is just committed to trying to approach, trying to get into Rat King's face with these lingering aerials. That good old Mac does not care a single minute about. There is not a there not a worry in his head about whether or not he can deal with these lingering aerials. So you have to play to where you have to play the little Mac matchup a little bit stronger. Focus on juggling and most importantly, grab. We've not seen one grab from Trapari the entire set. <laughs> And these dash attacks aren't doing it. <laughs> Rat King with the uppercut up smash to seal away game number three. It is Iona taking home the dub in a two stock fashion in that third set. And I, I think you really hit the, the nail on the head there. Those grabs, we did not see a single one, I think, that set, or at least in this game in particular. We saw a couple, I think, Zares in game number one, maybe in game number two. But that Z button really just did not get used by Jabari this set. And time and time again, Rat King just said, I have a trump card. It's called armor. And just punch after punch continued to land. And I really feel like the turning point was that that early upbeat by Jabari. Not quite sure what he wanted to do there, whether it be a, a, a boomerang throw maybe to try and set something up upon landing. But either way, Rat King was quick to punish it, and all of a sudden, Jabari was left with no room for error. Yeah, this snare was really good. I mean, we see the double jump being used. You know, most of the time, Little Mac players uh, mix up uh, getting back onto stage by either going to ledge or jumping onto stage with a counter. And uh, this, this situation, Jabari was built for. Intercepting Little Mac in the air with Young Link's quicker frame data. Hey, this is what Young Link does, period. But the... Uh, what is this frame here? Oh, it is... Is that the... Is that counter or is that neutral B? That might be counter. I, I mean, I know that's something that we'd seen a couple of times from Rat King in that set is, you know, he, he used that counter a couple of times to recover. But... Jabari there just able to get that nair off just in time and I was actually before this up smash happened I was gonna say I feel a counter coming he has really not used that move a whole lot this set only upon recovery and if he just you know if Rack, or sorry if Jabari just keeps approaching with things like dash attack it felt like it was it, it felt like it was due but either way Iona, they get the two-stock victory in that third game. They get the bonus points on top, and they get the win by a final score of 17-12. to 12. And this one, that was a blast to kick off yeah. the day. This was really a nail-biter. It was a real tough one, and it's a shame that it had to go down. It had to finish the way that it started with the set. Despite going to game three, it really felt like it was in Rat King's firm grasp at the end of the day, finishing the, finishing the set with a double two-stock. But, I, I mean, you can't argue from the fact that it came down to the last set. Everything was so close, going back and forth. 
with a, even a little bit of drama along the way, it was a well, it was a amazing way to start a series on this week, a series of sets for this week. But we've got even more coming. We do have even more coming. And coming up next, we've got an interview with, I believe, Yaliso from the side of Iona. We'll get to pick their brains about this set. Don't touch that dial now. We're just getting started. <laughs> 